Uh, so welcome and thank you for joining us in the first of a series of three webinars uh, in the Gender Power Gap uh, series. Um, a few weeks ago, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres noted that the gender power gap is now an official UN concern. He said this, gender inequity is the overwhelming injustice of our age and the biggest human rights challenge we face. But gender equity offers solutions to some of the most intractable problems of our time. He concluded by saying, gender equality is fundamentally a question of power. Our discussion today will focus on this critical issue of gender power in company executive suites. So first, let me just start with a brief introduction of myself. My name is Patience Marima Ball. I'm the founder and CEO of Women of the World Endowment, an investment nonprofit focused on centralizing women as economic, environmental, and social change makers while delivering market rate returns and impact at scale. We invest in building strategic capital, which we leverage to support systems change. Our collaboration with the Execuci, with Andreas and his team, is part of our work to influence capital markets. Uh, and it is with incredible excitement that I welcome and introduce Professor Andreas Hopner. Andreas, I was practicing my German before this. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> He's a scientific advisor at Execuci. Andreas currently focuses on advice on advancing the underlying technologies as well as designing powerful SDG me measures such as gender share. He is the full professor of operational risk, banking and finance at University College Dublin and is serving as an independent member that is in his personal capacity of the EU platform on sustainable finance where he's heading the data sub subgroup. Pre previously, Andreas served on the technical expert group on sustainable finance, where he was the scientific lead for benchmarks. In this role, he co-developed the EU Paris Aligned Benchmark and the EU Climate Transition Benchmark. His research has won several awards, including the 2019, 2015, and 2010 Principles for Responsible Investment Best Paper Awards. He received his PhD from the University of St. Andrews in 2010, and served as lead academic advisor for the PRI from 2009 to 2016. Uh, I just have to tell you, I've been, um, Andreas has been sharing his data with, with us at Huawei, and I've seen it, and I can tell you that you're all in for a treat, treat. So let me turn it over to Andreas to start off with the review of the data. Andreas, over to you. Thank you very much, Patient. The very kind introduction is, is much appreciated. And I would like to show you some data, which uh, in itself you might have been dis seen discussed in the media and Bloomberg or Fortune, but I think it's, it's very important to discuss with everybody and we'll be extremely happy for two questions from anyone at any point in time. Patience, could you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, I can see a screen, Andreas. And now I'm gonna go to you. Excellent. So, but thanks to my courses best, my sister Clarina and uh, Florian, my other course, uh, we'd like to show you just a headline introduction on where we are in terms of gender share. So our technology allows us to observe week in, week out, what happens to executive gender diversity. And by executives, we mean any executive who is actually um, uh, either represented in the annual report or in SEC filings, such as the 10K and the proxy statement, or is represented on the website. And so we can see that the total number in terms of headcount of females is actually gradually ticking up a little bit step by step, week by week. And so we're at about 25% right now for the average uh, company in uh, the S&P 500 setting uh, in terms of headcount. That's not good, but that's also not a full disaster. If we actually count these statistics slightly different, so we count it not as an average of the company values, but we actually count it as a total. So there is um, 8,000 executives, say, and 2,000 of them are women, roughly speaking. Then we get a slightly higher number. So 25.7% is the universe, the overall S&P 500's uh, gender diversity. Now, of course, headcount is not equivalent to power. So 
you might have a group where 30% of the group by headcount are female, but the females might be in specific roles, that's HR or other roles, where unfortunately there is not uh, that much power. And quite often the headline numbers, most notably uh, the UK number that the majority of independent directors in the UK, according to Stern Stewart now, is actually female, while only one in nine executive directors is female, they show a very distinct difference between just sitting at the table and influencing the decision-making. And of course, the key should be diversity in influencing the decision-making. Having served for three years as vice principal for quality, diversity, and inclusion at my college, uh, we've discussed this many times internally and getting to that decision-making uh, equality is eventually the holy grail. How do we get an equivalent, at least, uh, of power between males and females? And so if we then look into what happens if we actually include shareholders only, so only those executives who are relevant enough that the company effectively has given them uh, share packages that they have then also uh, that are vested and that the individuals are now uh, owning. And so if we only include those, we're actually getting numbers around 21.3% on the company average and around 22.3% if we look at the um, entire universe. And so that already drops a bit, meaning that uh, being a shareholder is more common for a male executive than for a female executive. If we now, however, say, okay, this is still a headcount, so just a headcount of the more relevant executives, let's move to the next step and actually see who are those who own a lot of value rather than a little value. So we, we don't count it by headcount anymore, we count it by monetary value. Then we actually see that on an average basis for a company, it's just only 12%. So the 25% number from the beginning, more than halves, if we look at the value uh, of the shares that female executives own compared to all executives. So that is already a quite significant uh, differentiation. And now, and that is a particular tragic aspect here, and I need to directly say this value has been in the report in the press, but it's shifting a little bit depending, of course, on market movements on a given week. But if we then look at it not at the company average perspective, but at simply taking all the value of the shares added together in the S&P 500 and taking the female part of that divided by the overall male and female part, females among all shares held in the S&P 500 hold less than 1% at the moment, 0.96% of the value of the shares of executives of the S&P 500 are held by females. That is effectively the motivation for doing this tripart research webinar series. We'll engage in further webinars with detailed questions as to why this is the case and what one can do about it and in which industries this is particularly unfortunate but quite literally, as Fortune, for instance, reported about our research, there is a 99 to 1 ratio, male to female power, but there's only, in quotation marks, a 3 to 1 ratio, male to female headcount. That's why I believe it's just so relevant to talk about it, because that difference in power, the giant gender power gap, may be actually the source of all the other symptoms of inequality between genders. Thank you for this incredible uh, data, um, and um, I've I've been along for the ride as as this data is shifting. I remember when uh, you had ninety six percent of the companies covered, and it looked like maybe it was close to two percent, um, or you, and then you know you had a hundred. Now you have a hundred percent of the companies in the S and P five hundred covered, and it's down to one percent. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, maybe we should be celebrating the 2%. Maybe you should have kept it at 96% coverage or something. I mean, it's, it's just incredibly sad, right, um, th this data. Um, so, so uh, Andres, if we could just start with the inspiration for collecting this data. What motivated Execushi to start collecting this data? And then we're going to go into um, the implications of uh, first, maybe if you could just uh, address what motivated you uh, and the team to collect this data. 
Well, we're financial data scientists, which is very big hard for the SDGs. 90% of our work is, is SDG focused, probably more than 90%. And I, I personally, just out of pure um, common sense, I'd say, always wondered why there was such a focus on the women on the board when this effectively are the part-time women running the company, while there was so little focus on the women in top executives when these are the full-time women running the company. And then uh, Credit Suisse 3000 report, I read this about, well, that must be six years ago or something, um, maybe seven even, and they concluded at some point that the gender diversity of female executives, they put a report of once a year where among their research universe, they kind of estimate the gender diversity of female executives. It really depends on which positions you include in. So if you categorically say chief HR and chief investor relations are top executives, you make the gender diversity number look a lot better than if you exclude these two positions categorically. And then over time, it daunted on us that uh, as data scientists, we don't like to make theoretical decisions. We like to make evidence-based decisions. And so having had the idea to say, we're not going to decide if chief HR is part of top management or not. We let every company decide themselves by the information that they disclose. Uh, the idea was born that we can actually focus on top executives and thereby help the world understand much better who are the top executives that uh, may experience a huge gender power gap, maybe also who are the top executives who are running the companies that uh, cause us the climate crisis. So um, top executives are immensely important for businesses and surprisingly little is known about them except for the five that are best paid in the US because that's easy data. But uh, uh, as soon as it gets a little bit harder, quite often people give up and, and we thought, well, we need to not give up and actually dig deeper. And uh, we think these numbers show very clearly that without someone digging deeper, uh, you're looking um, at a headline number and that may be, may be bad, but not too bad. But then the actual depth number of 1% is just all very shocking. Yeah. Um, so, so a couple of things that you said, um... Andreas, uh, that hit me. One, that uh, you are not going to decide what really matters to companies um, in terms of you know, the C-suite positions that are critical. Uh, this, this data that you've surfaced actually tells us um, as we look at it and we, you know, we have the opportunity to, um, to share more in the next webinars about the specifics by industry and maybe we'll even discuss a couple of firms. Uh, these firms are telling us how important they think these positions are by how much shares they're giving to these, um, to, to these female executives, uh, because as you said, it translates to power. Um, so that's, that's one of the things um, that you just said that, uh, that inspired me. And two, um, that um, mainstream channels mostly focus on the headline numbers, right? So number of female CEOs in the uh, S&P 500, and I think, you know, it's between 32 and 35. I don't know what the actual number is, but uh, that's a headline number. Not, it's not, the rest of us are largely not aware of the data that is, that, you know, that includes share ownership, for instance. And if we could just maybe uh, double click on some of the implications, downstream implications of that or focusing on the headline numbers and not uh, the rest of the data. So for instance, um, we, don't, we have pay inequity uh, and, and you know, not share ownership in equity, which you've now given us something to think about, but generally pay equity and a number of other uh, systemic issues. Is it your uh, belief that some of these downstream issues are simply uh, as a result of um, uh, th th these, these power dynamics in the executive rooms. Could you just give us a sense of what you think about that? Uh, well, thinking is developing patience, so we're, we're studying it as we speak, but um, there, there is certainly indications that it may well be that that 199 number, which fortunately now we managed to make a bit of a headline number itself, is actually the root cause of quite a few of the other issues. Because when you think about it, if those that are most powerful in the system are 99% more likely, uh, broadly speaking, to be male than female, 
then a lot of the system level decisions um, aren't actually necessarily in the favor of women. And uh, so, for instance, the, the, the book by the Spanish lady whose name, unfortunately, I'm blanking on, my sister would know it immediately, that the actual data system and all the data collection is more written for men than for women um, uh, is very much reflected here as well. That in essence, we, we, when we look, for instance, at individual positions, we find at the moment that across the average industry, and of course this differs, um, the position that is getting the second uh, most shares is not even the CFO, it's actually the CTO. And uh, chief HR, which is a very common female role, is, is much further down the road, while CTO is a, is a role where there's even less women than the CEO role. And so uh, all of these um, weights is how important other C-suite roles are, as reflected by the uh, value of the shares they own, uh, indicate that it's really a system which in, in most sectors, not all sectors, I mean, there's, there's other sectors where say branding is more important, um, it, it is uh, still very much a male game, at least at the very top of it. Yeah, and and this is um, this is data that's important, and at the same time surprising when you look at uh, some of those C-suite roles, and you do uh, a comparison of, you know, and this is not academic research that I'm about to to cite, but just uh, SM, the S and P recently. Uh, issued a report or had a report that showed the performance, uh, the share performance of um, of uh, the S and P 500 companies, uh, which showed that women-led companies were actually outperforming male-led companies uh, over the last six years. And maybe uh, this is um, a chart we'll be able to show in our some of our subsequent webinars. Um, and then if you look at CFO, I don't know about CTO, I think that's, that's another one that you should be uh, looking to review. But if you look at CFOs, there's data that shows that um, in the first two years of a female uh, becoming CFO of a company, you actually have better performance, you have um, better uh, bottom line numbers uh, when women um, become CFOs of, of, of companies, C CFOs of uh, Fortune 500 companies. And that's also data that we should be, you know, share that we should share in subsequent um, webinars. And and given that data, what's surprising to me is that obviously there's good delivery of value from these women. These women are not getting these roles uh, just to be um, because the 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 uh, companies just want a female. They're getting these roles because actually. They have the receipts, they deserve it. They're very capable, hence the performance. Why is it that we, we don't see them being uh, rewarded accordingly uh, is a big question um, that I have. And I'm hoping that uh, some of the data that you've surfaced might, might give some insights, uh, but also I would just love your, your viewpoint on this. I mean, that, that's very much a research question out for investigation. The very good news is that the data will eventually allow us to investigate this. Um, a, there's a couple of potential hypotheses, but I can really only make them up, well, not make them up, but discuss them as I speak because I don't have the, the, the evidence yet. So one is, of course, simply age. Uh, it might just be that uh, female CTOs are at this stage still on average younger than male CTOs, and they're just gradually um, coming up the ranks in terms of age because clearly, historically, two, three decades ago, we would have had a much bigger problem. Another one is that in, in some situations, the very powerful uh, recruiting uh, for power dynamics may be slightly more than they recruit for um, performance dynamics. So they recruit someone where loyalty is a little bit more um, uh, sought after than uh, performance. And there, uh, the, the uh, proverbial old boys club uh, might uh, be a bit of a challenge. Um, uh, so we, we need to really investigate a whole range of potential explanations. Uh, I think we, we can, at this stage, size the problem as a, literally a 1991, uh, and that's an important starting point. Um, we have like a, a working hypothesis that that gender power gap may be the source of all sort of related problems in terms of gender pay gap, uh, in, in terms of various other aspects. We can investigate that by going into more detail across the different sectors. So 
sectors where the gender power gap is not as big as others, are they generally better also in terms of gender pay gap and so forth? So we have avenues for investigation and um, we'll, we'll process these investigations as, as soon and fast and as rigorous as we can. Yeah, yeah. And, and we'll be cheering you on uh, as you do that, Andreas, and as, as well as hoping that we'll come back to more of these webinars because uh, we need to get to a place where mainstream channels are, are not just obsessed and focused on the, on the, on the numbers, on the headcount, um, but really more focused on um, the nuances and the implications of those um, you know, uh, nuanced uh, reviews. Uh, maybe at this point, um, Andreas, we can invite others to join us in this conversation. I do not have visibility uh, of the questions, but I believe we have support on that. Could um, could someone share a few of the questions in the in the in the chat? And Andreas, could you take them? Absolutely. And let me just maybe make one summary when you're referring to mainstream. So I think uh, for all our listeners today, either live today or generally uh, later on online. I think there's a couple of points that's very important. What is most important are the full-time executives, not the part-time board members in terms of gender diversity. It's pretty obvious, right? If we're happy with the fact that a lot of part-timers are female, we're not going to change the power dynamics. It's good that that is the case. I appreciate 50% gender board diversity, but board members are part-time. They're not full-time. And uh, full-time people is really where the power lies. And then among the full-time executives, we need to get that 25% number up in terms of headcount. And then especially we need to get the gender power uh, gap closed massively from the 1991 to, to much better ratio. So that the three things I think to, to, to uh, as takeaways, if I may focus on full-time executives, not only part-time board members, and then among these full-time executives, let's get better gender diversity because that's only 25%. That's nowhere near 40 or 50%. And then let's get this gender power gap at least to start closing so that the actual ownership that uh, females have of the value of the shares is decreasing. Does that sound good, patients? Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And um, uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, the first one, it says, how has female leadership in the, um, sorry, it, it disappeared on me. Um, I can see it, yeah. If you can see it. Yeah, I can see it. So the, the question reads out, how has female leadership in the S&P 500 grown over the last 10 years? So, so we can say that it, it definitely has grown. It tends to trail uh, female board membership by at least 5%. So we've analyzed this as well. So uh, we're currently running on about 25% um, uh, uh, females among top executives and more than 30% females in boards, I believe, in the S&P 500. And I think that has been the case historically as well. Um, over the last year, we saw about a 1% growth. Uh, and um, the best sectors in terms of gender diversity are household products and pharmaceuticals. And the sectors that have a lot of catching up to do is the energy industry and semiconductors. Not surprising, right? But no. you, you make a good point about um, uh, two. Well, actually, the point that you made about the numbers that female executives trail female board members by about 5% over the last, the growth has trailed um, uh, board members over the last 10 years is interesting, especially when you uh, combine it with the point that you made that female board members are simply part-time um, uh, influencers uh, of how a company uh, runs its operations. Um, and as part-time, and maybe that's an easier thing for companies to embrace rather than actually embracing having full-time people who are embedded in the organization, but even more important, giving them enough power to absolutely be at the table and taking those seats firmly and influencing change uh, is the next thing. So thank you very much for, for uh, clarifying that it is, this difference is important uh, and hopefully the headline numbers will begin to shift and, and you've had good coverage of these numbers, you know, the 99.1%, uh, you've had good coverage in the last a month or so. My hope is this coverage does not actually taper down, but we keep, we continue 
to see more of the kinds of analysis that you're doing here, uh, Andreas. Um, I, we had another question come in. Um, if uh, Wendy has put it in, it's a question from Scott. Can you take it, Andres? Uh, absolutely, and we also got further audience questions here as well. So um, uh, a question from Scott here is, are there plans to take this analysis across other regions of the world? Uh, any predictions how they could compare? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. Thank you very much, Scott, and this is crucial. So uh, just looking at gender diversity, so for instance, for a European audience, we know that France tends to have higher numbers um, than the US. The UK has about numbers that are on par, maybe slightly lower. And then Germany, for instance, has lower numbers. And if I then take the same analysis to Japan, I get very low numbers. If I take it to India, I get also very low numbers. If I go to Hong Kong, slightly higher numbers than in, say, Japan or India. So around the world, uh, these questions are very, very important. And there's obviously three, four billion uh, women on the planet, um, uh, all of which I think asking very relevant questions about this. And so we are very much aiming to analyze this for, for any relevant market. And if I may just come back before taking all these extra questions that are coming through from Jana and Daniela and Force, which is massively appreciated, guys. Please post questions. We're here for a debate. The, the Stern Stewart study says the majority of Female independent director, the majority of independent directors on UK company boards are female, but only one in nine executive directors is female. Another way to say this more drastically is the majority of part time directors is female, but only one in nine full time directors is female. So that, in essence, highlights the massive discrepancy and the issue that too long. The sustainable finance industry has been happy uh, in the gender diversity question to take the part-time numbers and say, all right, okay, we've got the part-time, that's nice. And, and of course, that is very easy for a company to say appoint a female professor within the course of two, three weeks, you have another female board member. So I'll, I'll take the question if I, as I read it here from, from uh, Daniela. Uh, could the power gap as presented for the S&P 500 be mirrored to the European area um, as well? If not, uh, how can we evaluate it? Uh, Daniela, this is an excellent question. Uh, as, as a German living in Ireland, I do have to congratulate the United States for the fantastic SEC disclosure. So the SEC disclosure is simply um, uh, second to none on the planet in terms of the accuracy of the executive shares. However, the US power per position on shares allows us to generate an estimated power gap for Europe and we're very much intending to do that. So uh, in the European case, we can say, for instance, CTOs tend to have more power than chief HR officers. So where are the females based on the CTO or the chief HR position? So we're very much intending um, uh, to actually uh, take that analysis on. Shall we, um, the patients, are you happy for me to take the questions as they come here? There's a lot of them. Yeah, no, well, absolutely. Let's, let's do that. And um, the, the, the next one about what can we do, I would love to, you go first and I'd love to take that question along with you. Just add to, to whatever you, you end up saying. Perfect, excellent. So uh, Charlene's question, uh, what can we start to do? Is, uh, is a message for exec women to demand company shares in their packages and the shareholders to demand women uh, uh, are, offer, are offered uh, them? So. I think that's that's excellent. So number one, yes, shareholders should uh, demand female managers are offered uh, share packages and executive women uh, should demand it as well. Shareholders should screen their portfolios to understand to what extent they are inadvertently supporting the gender power gap. There might be foundations of very influential women where the data looks like they're actually massively in support of the gender power gap, probably unwillingly. Um, and then shareholders may or may not want to invest to an extent in a way that is at least not supportive of the kind of biggest uh, discrepancies in uh, gender power gap. Patience. And I'll just add that I think it's, it's, it's an everyone kind of um, um, opportunity to influence, right? Because if you are a little further down the, the rung in a, in, a, in a company, in an S&P 500 company or any company for that matter, um, if you do not, if you look up and you do not think that the composition that is skewed uh, in one way or another impacts you, I think um, this data tells you that you might be wrong. You are wrong. 
uh, we know that uh, diverse decision making does make a difference in how a company comes um, uh, often. Uh, no difference in terms of the packages, uh, the packages, the benefits, the, the work culture uh, of organizations. And all of these things actually should matter to everyone, um, whether it's shareholders, um, the, the women executives themselves, but every single one of us, the workers, um, down the, the many levels in, in, a, in a given company. And I think there is, there is uh, um, if we have uh, an all of us strategy, we might actually see some difference. And part of it starts with having the data, right? Having the data, but then also capturing the so what. So the data tells us that women don't have enough power but what is the what are the implications of that and being able to articulate that and and discuss the missed opportunity that um, that companies have to to do better but also to 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 do well in terms of financial returns but also do better in terms of how they look after their their um, employee base is really important and there is we have another one um, that is similar to this another question that talks to you know the solutions as well so the private sector and the investor world can do something. We have a question here that says, could this also be a policy legislation um, uh, uh, area of, of intervention? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask you, Joanna, a question actually, Patience. So maybe I'll turn it to you first. So uh, are we seeing more solutions from a legislation side or through social activism and corporate culture? Um, with your experience, I'm happy to go a second on this question. Okay, very well. I think you, um, so. Legislation has worked, and so quotas is is the the traditional sort of uh, way that uh, policy has tried to come in this, and it has worked well in some instances and not so well in some instances. Um, we looked at this. I just um, uh, I just co-wrote a book that's coming out on June twenty first that looks at you know um, um, this issue of women. Uh, as change makers and women as solution drivers and not just as actors, not just beneficiaries. Uh, because traditionally capital markets has lo looked at women as, as beneficiaries and victims and not really mainstream actors. And I think that's part of the change that needs to happen and it needs to happen uh, through legislation, yes, through policies, yes. Uh, knowing that uh, in some instances, I think in the UK, uh, the, the policy has worked really well in some European countries, policy have worked well also in Australia. Uh, some of the um, regions uh, falling behind are uh, behind. In the US, uh, we don't have, um, we have a patchwork of policies. You know, California is ahead, is progressive. Some other states are not. Um, and so um, once again, it's an all of the above kind of strategy, right? If policy is going to work, that's good. So uh, in the book, we cover how policy can, some, can, can sometimes backfire. I think it's one of the Nordic countries, surprisingly, one of the Nordic countries that put in a policy. And what you saw were a lot of companies, and it was a policy related to uh, listed companies. So what you saw were companies deciding that they're going to delist. Uh, instead of actually doing the work of including women, um, as solution drivers uh, in, in the, um, this was mostly actually on their boards, they decided to delist. Uh, and, and that's unfortunate because, you know, in our view, they are um, losing, losing out on the opportunity to actually do better financially, to do better by their culture and as well as every, every other aspect that women and gender diverse teams bring to the table. And social activism, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a huge one. Um, um, you get shareholder action ultimately because sometimes, most of the time, is social activism that brings uh, these um, uh, gaps to, to the fore. And so uh, I think that that too is, is an incredibly uh, important tool. And the organizations across the world that are very good uh, at um, social activism or the they are fueled by social activism and they do shareholder activism. If you can translate activism to action, um, I think that's, um, that's where we, we get the win. So 
you know, from my perspective, we want all of the above. I would fully agree with this. Obviously, what we're doing here to an extent is social activism. Um, and it's, it's crucial to start measuring it because you're only going to manage what you measure. And then you're only kind of going to actually solve what you understand in that sense. So first, we have to measure it. Then we have to understand it better to eventually solve it. And you made a very important point there, Patience, with your trusty example from the Nordics. And Charlene's asking, will the company data on the power gap be made available to investors or will they have to ask the companies for it? The sad reality is, of course, this is an HC topic for many companies. That means they are not necessarily going to be forthcoming with most of the data. Investors can ask, and hopefully many companies will share, uh, but we shall do our best to make the data available anyway, because it is available, uh, both for the companies as well as for the investment managers that invest in these companies. Um, and so uh, we will we'll do our best to, to make all this data available so that people can start uh, measuring, monitoring, understanding, and thereby we can close this uh, gigantic uh, gender power gap of 99 to uh, 1%, which is uh, really uh, absolutely outright shocking. So, um, and and that requires further discussion and uh, we'll, we'll have specifically, because this is such a crucial topic, uh, decided to go for a three-part webinar series here to discuss further in terms of what are the courses, uh, what are the sectors where it's particularly prevalent, and very much looking forward to discussing it further. And we'd ask the audience to to spread the word uh, for everybody who's interested to discuss it with us and of course recordings will also be available online. Fantastic. And on that note, um, Andreas, I think we have covered all of the questions. Uh, if I if we've missed one, please uh, point that out to me. But I believe we've covered all the questions. And to a point about um, uh, how folks can become aware of this information, how it becomes more prevalent um, uh, among investors, but also just as I said, this is in all of their um, an everyone issue. If you are a worker, you should care. Uh, if you're an investor, you should care, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, this information being available is really important. And to Andres's point, we'll continue to we'll continue with making sure that we have uh, more of these webinars. But in addition to that, I think, Andreas, you've been doing a good job of sharing this data with mainstream channels of, um, of communication, you know, Bloomberg, you know, um, Fortune, et cetera. But I think there's also another opportunity and maybe we'll start talking about that when we get to the third webinar. So I'm going to just leave it there as a way of getting keeping people interested so they keep coming. But just to let you know, folks, um, thank you very much for being with us. Um, we are excited that this is not the end. We will have a part two of this conversation and part two will focus on the differences in the, the data as we see it in the different sectors which ones are the laggards, which ones are doing better. We can say which ones are doing well, because as you saw in the data, nobody's doing well. Uh, not, not, none of the industries are doing well. So we're gonna uh, focus on that uh, on June 28th at the same time. And then on July 12th at the same time, we'll dig a little deeper into the causes um, and what more we can all do to influence change. So this conversation around what else can be done to influence change, we'll, we'll double click on that. And hopefully um, by the second one and the third one, you will not come with questions, but more suggestions as, as part of the audience, as part of the community. Thank you very much. Andreas, any parting words? Yeah, any, any suggestions, appreciate it. Anyone who wants to explore the data, please feel free to reach out, very happy. And uh, next time we're going to look at who's doing better. And also we said they have to say, we're going to look at who's doing even worse than a 99 to one ratio in terms of sectors. So um, yeah, thank you very much and uh, have a good evening. Have a good day. Thank you. Good day. <laughs>